Here they come. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome. What a treat. Hi, Julia. A lot of familiar faces and names, which our panelists also mentioned as well. Great to see a lot of you. Okay. I like to tell my kids in film production this as well. Um, what is, how's it go? On time is late, early is on time. And if you're late, it's unforgivable. I mix it up a little bit, but I tell them that all the time. So be early. It's great to see a lot of you all. Thank you for being here. We got a thumbs up. Okay, so the emojis are still working. That's good. We got to have those. We'll give our guests here a minute to roll on in. And I wonder, Lindsay, if you're mainly just accepting people, is that the way you're going about it? Yes. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> Sorry we didn't prepare any cinematic intro music. That would have been cool. Finding Nemo or the Terminator soundtrack, didn't think about that. So for next year, we'll, we'll work on that. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay. Shall we? Okay. Good evening, Windward students, parents, faculty, alumni, and our wonderful community. Welcome to the very first Women of Innovation and Storytelling panel. My name is Drew Metz. I'm the director of the Media Arts and Film Labs. Our visual and media arts program here at Windward is robust, and we celebrate training our students into becoming thoughtful storytellers who explore both personal and socially meaningful narratives. In the past, we've had award-winning documentarians, screenwriters, showrunners, actors, and more to come visit our kids and discuss both the craft and the business of storytelling as well as its social challenges and inequalities. Well, tonight, we bring to you a very special and diverse panel of voices. This evening, we hope to elevate the discussion through these incredible women who have each created their own paths to create their careers and dreams. We hope to explore some of their aspirations during youth, how they entered the business, and how they are currently navigating their dreams and careers and are ever evolving often unfair, male-dominated industry. But what we hope this evening will illuminate to our students and community are the powerful stories, successes, and challenges of these three women who are innovating in the business and how young storytellers of any genre or any gender can play an integral part in making our industry and stories more inclusive, more dynamic, and more diverse. Your moderators tonight are Regina Hoffman, film and video class instructor, and Colleen Hargadon, Media Arts and Animation Instructor. I would like to now invite our faculty moderators to help me introduce our esteemed panelists. And it is with great pleasure that I first introduce Namina Forna. Namina is a breakthrough young adult novelist and screenwriter based in Los Angeles. She most recently became a New York Times and indie best-selling author for The Gilded Ones, which you can also get in our library which is an epic fantasy of the young adult genre. Originally from Sierra Leone, West Africa, Namina moved to the United States when she was nine and has been traveling back and forth ever since. I had the great privilege of befriending Namina at USC Film School to which even during our rigorous programs, in classes, outside of classes and everything in between, she was working on her novel, including the, the whole series of The Gilded Ones. Namina loves building fantastical worlds and telling stories with fierce female leads. 
In a recent interview about the Gilded Ones, Namna cited that she wants to write about what it means to be a woman and exist in a patriarchal society and to fight back. It is with great pride that I introduce her to you, the students. Please offer a round of digital or physical applause to Namna Forna. Wow, look at all that movement. All right. Regina, would you please take the baton? Yes, Namina, I just want to say I've been also devouring your book, and I recommend it to all those young students out there. Thank you so much for being here. I am so honored to be here with Marin and Jody and Namina. Um, this is like icing on the cake, just so you know, because two weeks ago we had a showcase and we had a hundred films that we watched, and then everyone got to see some of them during the showcase. So these students have been producing some amazing things in some very difficult situations. So I just, I just thank you guys for being here. I have the pleasure of introducing Jody Foster. So in a career spanning over 50 years, Jody Foster is without a doubt, one of the most critically acclaimed actors, innovators and filmmakers of her generation. Her roles in the following films have won her international attention. Martin Scorsese's Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore and Taxi Driver. The film Nell, Contact, David Fincher's Panic Room, The Brave One, and honestly, I could go on and on. I do not think Jodie Foster sleeps. Um, Foster's stunning performance in The Accused and The Silence of the Lambs earned her two Academy Awards for Best Actress. Behind the camera, Foster made her motion picture directorial debut in 1991 with Little Man Tate, in which she also starred. She went on to direct Home for the Holidays, The Beaver, Money Monster, and more recently episodes of Orange is the New Black, House of Cards, Black Mirror, and Tales from the Loop. So please uh, welcome Jodie Foster. Thank you for being here. And Colleen. Um, this is just amazing. Thank you to all our panelists for being here. You're Wonderful. And I have the honor of introducing Marin Hinkle, um, who's adored for her role as Rose on the award winning series, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which she was nominated twice for an Emmy Award for Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Comedy Series. Marin has also garnered two Screen Actors Guild Awards for Outstanding Performance by an Ensemble in a Comedy Series for the show. Throughout the 12 year run of CBS's award winning series, Two and a Half Men, Marin played Judith. Prior to this, she portrayed Judy on ABC's beloved series, Once and Again. Her diverse television credits include recurring roles on Speechless, Homeland, Madam Secretary, and Brothers and Sisters, among others and dozen feature films, including the most recent Jumanji films, both directed by Windward alum, Jake Kazvan. Marin's extensive theater credits include Broadway shows Electra, A Thousand Clowns, and The Tempest. She has originated work in many off-Broadway plays and regional theater productions. Um, born in Tanzania, but growing up in Boston, Marin furthered her education with a bachelor's um, from Brown University and a master's from New York University. I'm so excited to have you here, Marin. Thank you. Give it up. So community, now our questions. For those of you that are participating today, you can send me a message directly. Uh, just keep in mind, we have a limited amount of time and we've also had some of our film students and animation students pre-screen some questions that we'll have later in the evening. But if you'd like to ask the panelists something directly, please send me a message and we'll see what we can do. Without further ado, here's our Women of Innovation and Storytelling. Well, I'm going to get us started with the first question, and I think this is really relevant for our audience because, and I also have an 11th grader, so they are all wondering what are they going to do? What are they going to major in? What, is, what are they going to do with the rest of their life? So the question for the three of you is what dreams did you have as a child? Um, maybe it wasn't acting right away, or maybe for you, Jody, it was because I know you started at a very young age. And then at what point did you kind of figure out, no, this is what I wanna do. I wanna go into um, the entertainment industry. Um, just so we can do this equally, I'm just gonna start with Jody, and then let's do Namina and, and Marin. So Jody, if you could start us off with some childhood dreams. Uh, I have a little bit of a weird story because I started acting when I was three. So I don't really remember uh, starting. I, I have vague memories of being in a bikini and being cold. That's about it. Um, but 
you know, I was raised on movie sets and to me it was home. It felt like a family. And um, this idea of creating and doing something that felt meaningful and important among grownups who, who valued me, I think that was sort of the addictive part to it. And uh, I knew that I wanted to keep, keep going with that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that as, as the time went on, it became more articulate for me. What I really wanted to do was explore sides of myself and talk about things that I cared about and that moved me and to try and reach out to other people. So I think that's really what I was thinking of as a young person was, you know, how can I talk about things that I want to talk about and have other people understand or respond or connect? And Namina. Um, so I grew up in Sierra Leone, West Africa and my parents were diplomats. So I sort of figured that that was what I was gonna do. I figured I was gonna go to law school, probably join the UN system and eventually become an ambassador or something like that. It was very sort of prescribed, like this is what you've seen everybody else do. So this is probably the path for you, but I never did have any um, passion for it. And I always knew that. <laughs> Okay, and Marin. Um, uh, let's see. I I have parents that are actually not in in the arts. They're um, intellectuals and ac academics, and they. Um, I think growing up, I, I I I loved reading, and so I read myself to sleep and loved fairy tales. I just have a memory of that actually, and sort of like the world's best fairy tales. It was like my secret place to escape. And I was uh, also had a lot of energy um, and without, uh, yeah, I guess we could call that like spirited or something. And so my mom pretty early threw me into dance classes to kind of get rid of some of that extra energy. And I was lucky enough at an early age, not, not as early as Jody at three, but like at five or six, I was in the Nutcracker and that kind of fantasy life every Christmas time for about 20 performances, being able to watch, you know, nutcrackers grow and mice become kings and all this. I think I I felt like that the the that the escape route for me, the most exciting place to um, separate from a, a path that felt like the the more predictable path. Um, and, uh, and Amina was saying, I, I got excited by the idea of performance. And I had, I got injured when I was 16. And that threw me into a depression, but I was lucky enough to get into Brown. And at Brown, I had these incredible um, artistic uh, students that were like the hero heroines and heroes to me. And I would hang out with them and think, I really, to be honest, love this community so much. So I, like Jody said, was drawn to like like-minded, exciting people. And then I segued into theater because I thought, okay, I wanna combine my sort of interest in fantasy life with uh, stage life, with like a group of kind of, uh, I wouldn't call us misfits, but I would say we were the eccentrics on campus and I felt maybe most at home there. So that that was what I was drawn to as a, as a young person then. Awesome, so it sounds like community was a huge part of, of your decisions, okay. All right, I think Colleen's gonna take over for a little bit. Yes, and you know, we have so many young creatives in the audience. And you know, when you're starting off in the arts, there's often adults, either mentors or um, you know, folks in the field who you look to for inspiration. So I would love to ask um, each of you who some of your heroes are or were um, either personally like a mentor or someone just in the field who you thought was like awesome and who you were like, I wanna do that. Um, so who are some of those people and why? Um, maybe we'll start with Namina and then Jody and then back to Marin. Um, so I don't know if this is a personal hero, but this was sort of my inspiration to get into writing. Um, as I said, like I always thought I was gonna go straight that diplomacy path. And writing was just never um, something that seemed like an option for me because like as an African immigrant, really you have like a couple of options which are law, engineering, doctor, like, you know? And like, those are your things. Those are the things that you do. And if you do anything, it's sort of like, um, you have chosen like the end of the world. 
Um, so I never, I didn't even realize that you could make money being a writer until um, JK Rowling came on the scene with, um, with Harry Potter. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that like you can write books and people pay you money for this? Because like, so growing up, I had like a really, really active imagination. Um, so I grew up um, at the beginning, I grew up at the beginning of the Sierra Leonean civil war, which was not a fun time. Um, and so how I escaped was I would read all the time, constantly, always fantasy. So growing up, like to sort of escape, I had a very rich inner world and I'd always make up stories. And so at some point it was either like, it's either you're crazy or you're a writer, choose one. You know what I mean? Because like, that was sort of like the way how everybody else saw it. Um, so when I saw uh, JK Rowling come along, I was like, I think this is what I'm meant to do. I think this is my path. And so, um, and, and so I made the decision to become a novelist around 19, much to the horror of my family and my community who like everybody like fell out. Like it was like, I had, I don't know, like I had chosen like the worst possible option. Everyone was like, this is the end of the world. But I was like, no, I think this is what I'm meant to do. This is just how I'm naturally inclined. And so I went down that path. So I don't know if she's a, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say she's a hero, but I will say that she nudged me in that path. Great, thank you so much. Jody. how about for you? Um, well, um, I, I, as an actor when I was young, I, I never thought that I would ever be an actor when I grew up. I mean, it was definitely, you know, my mom definitely kept asking me whether I was gonna be a doctor or a lawyer. And I think that meant that I was, I should really not think about the acting thing. I think she was trying to protect me because usually child actors don't grow up to be, uh, or at least in those days, didn't grow up to be adult actors. Um, but I was really drawn to the idea of directing. Uh, when I was six, I saw a guy who was working on a television show and he was one of the actors, he played the dad. And suddenly one day he was the director of the TV show. And I thought, oh, they let the actors direct? And at that, you know, that was it. I knew that that was something that I wanted to aspire to that I wanted to do. Uh, I went to a French school. Nobody in my family spoke French. Um, so I had this weird European education as a young person and my mom would take me to see European movies and um, especially French films. And I'd have to watch the movies and then explain them to her later. And uh, we saw a lot of that sort of French new wave, uh, Louis Mal, you know, Claude Chabrol or, you know, all those, those types of films. And um, there was something about the exoticism of it always being in a different language and the idea that these were auteur directors um, that made me feel like this was something I wanted to do, but there really weren't any women directors. Um, but I found one, which was Lena Wertmuller, the German, the Italian director, wonderful, amazing director who did this, these kind of, these kind of dark tragic comedies that I loved. Um, I saw every one of her movies over and over again. And I thought, okay, if she can do it. I can do it. I think that's what, uh, that drew me to it. Thanks. Yeah, it's pretty incredible because, you know, it's such this like winding path of the arts and everyone's like, you know, it, they say that it's hard, but then you just like get the spark of like, oh my gosh, here's this person doing it and it's amazing and you just like catch the bug. <laughs> um, Marin, how about for you? Um, I think my earliest um, mentor definitely is, is my mom um, and probably still is. As she uh, went to law school when I was quite young. I was in about first grade and she still, you know, was balancing. She was actually teaching also and taking care of two kids and with my dad, of course. And I, I think um, making, uh, just sort of making her happy was, was something that I was looking forward to doing. Like actually these, these other two wonderful women on this panel is I, I think that she probably thought as other people did that like a lawyer or a doctor or therapist was where I was, I, I was headed. Um, but, but back to sort of what I was saying originally about, you know, why I, I ended up choosing, choosing this dream of acting is I, I think, um, 
my family was kind of serious. And I think that when I could make them laugh a little bit, there was such a, a joy in that, that I wanted to, to be part of that kind of relief and release in a family. And that um, even the stories, it's not that I'm a funny person, by the way, I'm not funny at all. It's, I, I'm lucky to have worked in comedy when people write funny things that I can say them. It's not me that's funny, but, but, but um, like kind of making like characters that I was playing or meeting come alive was really joyous in my household. And so I have a memory of like going to bed thinking, oh, I made my mom laugh or my dad laugh. And so um, anyway, that was one of the, the first, the first things that was a draw for me. It's funny. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Thank you so much for that story and all of your responses. Um, I'm going to throw it back to Regina. Okay, um, so we wanted to just change things up a bit because we're here for the students. And so Jody, I have like your super fan out there. His name is Ben Blah. He's in my film one class and he has a question for you. So I'm going to read it and I would love to get your response. So this is what Ben wants to know. And by the way, if I ever have any assignment, like let's talk about character development, Silence of the Lambs. Let's talk about cross cutting, Silence of the Lambs. He is on that film every single time, okay? So here's what Ben wants to know. You've been in the industry since you've been very young and you've played and directed a whole lot of films. Have there been any big changes over that time that has happened in the industry when it comes to the handling of a production of the film? And he's saying besides technology, so not the changes in technology, but is there anything that you've seen over the years that has been any big changes in the film production side of things? Hmm. Um, well, somehow it does interface with technology, right? But there's a, ser a series of things, e every six or seven years, things change in the film business. Um, you know, the global economy really changed things. When America was this great exporter of culture and, um, you know, we were, we were basically, you know, um, how do you say that, covering the world with our product, that really, that really changed things for the movie industry. Um, you know, you can't you can't erase the fact the fact that digital technology has changed everything from the film business. Things that weren't possible, uh, things that took you forever to do, can now be done. You know, on my on my telephone, really. You know, on my cell phone. Um, I th I think the biggest switch now is the one that we're going into, uh, which I find fascinating. Um, I, the last ten years have. Um, have seen this strange kind of ghettoizing of how films are distributed. So you have the big major distribution companies of which there are five or six, and they decided as a business model to, uh, in order to maximize as much money as they possibly could, that they would make very big films that cost a lot of money that were franchises, superheroes, things like that, maybe some big comedies. And that they really wouldn't get involved with narrative film that much because they just didn't know that it was such a good business decision. Um, that was because the streaming and cable and all of those uh, industries were coming up, and they 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 either they each each one of them was pointing fingers at why this happened. Uh, but now the streaming companies are the companies that are really handling what we call narrative film and serious film and smaller films, pretty much everything other than franchise films and uh, big distribution movies. Um, that's uh, good news and bad news for all of us. Uh, the industry has gone through huge changes. Uh, the pandemic probably, you know, being the death knell to, to the way things used to be. Um, and we'll see what happens and what emerges on the other end of that. Um, I think it's exciting. Uh, we'll see whether people go back to movie theaters now that their habits have been changed uh, and, or whether they're happy with the experiences that they're having on the small screens. Okay, thank you so much. Ben will be very happy. <laughs> go ahead, Colleen. All right, oh, that, I miss the movies. Um, <laughs> all right, I've got a, a question, um, student question um, for Marin. Um, from uh, one of our students, Elle Crotty. Um, so she's wondering what kind of roles do you wish you could play but never seem to be cast as, if any? <laughs> and then conversely, are there any types of roles that you're tired of being typecast as? That's a great, thank you, that's a great question. Um, you know, um, it's interesting. Oh, let me see how I'll answer this. I, I, I tend to play a lot of 
um, like uh, uh, people with uh, aggressive personalities and they tend to be very judgmental and I don't know exactly why. Um, I guess I could go to like a therapist and ask, is there something in my energy? Because I've actually, I hope not really too much like that. Um, I, I have to say, I love pretty much across the board every role I've ever been offered. It's, it's like a smorgasbord of personality, like um, places to fly that I, I get thrilled by. I had this incredible thing happen. This is a little bit off the subject, but I'm gonna answer it this way. When I was in graduate school, I had an extraordinary teacher who since passed away. His name was Paul Walker. And um, I, as I said, had gone to Brown and I was very politically correct at Brown and I was definitely like a heady kid. And um, so the characters I tended to play were people that I thought were like very ethical, very strong-minded and very good, hopefully good people. And when I would do improv in this graduate acting program, every character I made, I tended to make them like that. And even if I was offered an, a role that was not like that, I still like placed the judgment of what I wanted to be inside or outside, I guess, that character. And so even as this person in my mid fifties, one of the things I would answer that question is, I wanna keep working on providing like a lack of judgment to the people that I am. And whether they be like all walks of life with all sorts of backgrounds and all sorts of ideas, just the way I wanna be in my own life in my most non-judgmental way, I, I wanna keep embracing characters that, that, are, that, that I can be in there like that. And ironically, sometimes I'm playing a judgmental character, so I don't even wanna judge the judgmental character. But um, I, I also would really like to play, um, I, I, socioeconomically of late, I think I've been playing people that are fancier and I'd like to be back in, in a grittier place because um, that's also just a place that uh, you, get, you get called um, into the same kinds of roles for, for, the, for, for a while. And it takes a lot of trust on a casting director's part to say, you know what, let's like shake that for that actress and let her really play something different from what we just saw for the past like 10 years or something that she was doing. But that's a great question, thanks. Yeah, thanks so much and what a great answer. I love how you talked about, you know, when you, it's like you have this little micro narrative of these of these different roles that you've played. And um, so thank you for it. Um, Regina, I think you've got one for Namina. Yes, Namina. Okay, another Ben, but a different Ben from film one. He wants to know what is your most vivid memory of your time growing up in Sierra Leone? And I wouldn't mind adding, um, uh, just to talk about your book a little bit, were some of those memories part of now your story in The Gilded Ones as well? That is honestly a very difficult question um, because my time, like I, I don't have a lot of memories uh, from my time in, like my memories blur together. Um, and the reason for that is again, I grew up during a war um, and it is sort of a facet of trauma where like your memories start, you know? So uh, that's, I, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I will say that in terms of how um, my time in Sierra Leone spurred my book. So Sierra Leone's a very patriarchal uh, country. Um, growing up, um, aside from the war, one of the things that we, as a girl, sort of loomed for me um, was uh, FGM, female genital mutilation. Uh, about 90% of women in Sierra Leone had, have had this happen to them. Um, I was very lucky because my parents were educated and they were like over my dead body. But I always grew up wondering why it was that like this was such a horrible thing because I always knew what it was like my parents were like, if you see this happening, don't go because, you know, um, I always I always wondered why it was that like the people who convinced you to do this were often your mother or your sister or someone you know, like a woman that was close to you and you trusted, you know, and it was always portrayed as a good thing. Like this is, this is great. For, like, this is what makes you a woman. This is what makes you pure. Um, and I just, I saw that and I saw in so many other ways how women um, were treated as lesser than. Um, and, and 
how oftentimes when they were treated as lesser than, um, it was sort of said, like the reasoning was always like some sort of nice reasoning, often religious or whatever. And then when I came to America, it was sort of the same because I came at the height of purity culture and I was like, oh, wow, this is sort of like the same thing. Um, so because of that, like I, I wanted to write a book that talked about what it means to grow up in a patriarchal society. You know, what does it mean when you grow up in a space that is not meant for you? Because um, for me, both being in Sierra Leone and being in America it was all sort of different facets of the same thing. And so uh, that's how I came up the book. with the book. I was like, okay, I want to create this book. I want it to be um, about girls. Um, and I want to talk about patriarchy, but I want to do it in a kick-ass way that like explains to people very sort of simply, um, you know, what, do, what does it mean to be in a patriarchal society? Who suffers? What institutions uphold it? And all of these things. And so all of that, I think, formatively started with Sierra Leone and just seeing how women were treated not only um, not only with like the FGM, but like also like the atrocities during the war, and then also coming here and seeing that oh, it's like the same thing. It's just more polite. So I don't know if that answers that question, but yeah. No, that was great. Thank you so much. I know we have many more questions about the book, but I'll let I'll let Colleen uh, take over for a bit. Yeah, and thank you for that. And I think this is actually, it's it's a segue into this question, which is also the spirit of this panel, which is about challenges or setbacks um, that you all might have faced as women in the industry, um, which, you know, is a predominantly male driven industry. And, um, and hopefully that's that's shifting gears a bit. <laughs> um, but I'd love to just ask a little bit about each of your experiences um, or any challenges or specific instances that you might have encountered. Um, and maybe we'll start with Jody and then Maren and back to Namina. Um, well, I do count myself as lucky uh, because I was so young in the industry that there were a number of uh, male figures, father figures, brother figures out there that had worked with me, that had, had experiences with me, and I was a kind of brought prodigal daughter for them. So they wanted me to, to succeed. They wanted me, they knew me, and they wanted me to be that, um, you know, first woman who did this or to give, to give me opportunities that other women who perhaps hadn't had that proximity uh, and who hadn't been inside the system didn't have access to. So I do recognize that, um, that I, you know, I'm incredibly lucky and that I receive privileges that uh, lots of other women in the industry didn't have. Um, that being said, you know, you know, you, you still have, you're still living in the world and there's lots of uh, microaggressions and more obvious aggressions that, that, that come along with the process of being a leader, what it means to be a leader and how, what your leadership style is. And of course, my leadership style as an actor, but as a director, especially and as a producer, is going to be very different than the kind of leadership style that a lot of men in the industry are used to. Um, and that uh, as a director, especially, you know, that, that, that can be very awkward. It can be uncomfortable and difficult. Um, for example, um, you know, I, I'm not, I wasn't raised to be one of those girls who, if you insult them, they just sort of cry and they say, I'm sorry, you're right. <laughs> um, and yet I also am cursed with not wanting to hurt people's feelings or to cause a fuss or to, um, you know, be aggressive or stand my ground in that way. Instead, I get steely and intellectual. So it was very difficult sometimes my leadership style of, uh, you know, when somebody said, you know, I'd like you to do such and such that I didn't want to do, my answer was, wow, that's very interesting that you feel that way. Shell, let's communicate. Let's talk about this. Um, I don't really believe that's something that I'm going, you know, and um, it was very off-putting. I think it was very difficult for a lot of uh, people in the industry to handle. Some not, you know, some people have those, that kind of sensitivity training, but others didn't. And they were just trying to figure out how to get their own way. They they were used to women uh, 
um, being dominated. And when that didn't work, um, they got nasty. Uh, and, and that that's it's been it's been interesting just to try to um, to watch the discomfort that people have with female leadership styles that they don't recognize. Yeah, thank you so much. And and Maren, how about for you, challenges that you faced um, related to your gender? Yeah. Um, well, a lot of what Jody just said, I, I've also experienced definitely. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell a little uh, getting out of graduate school st story. So when I got out of graduate school, they asked us to do a couple of scenes that were going to be shown to agents and managers. And it was sort of your time to, I guess, sell yourself. And I remember a lot of the talk was, you know, was the scene, I mean, I don't even want to use a word that, that I mean, what was your character sensuous enough? Although it wasn't quite said like that. It was like harsher. And were you gonna, like, what were you gonna wear in the scene? And um, yeah. And what's interesting is I didn't, I, there, were, there were 16 people in the class, eight women, eight men, three didn't get agents and all three were women. And I was one of the three. And I, an interesting story there also is that this, this lovely actor um, with a wonderful name, Nesbitt, Nesbitt Blaisdell told me, best thing that ever happened to you is to not have gotten an agent because those that do sometimes have red carpets that are like thrown their way. And years from, from that time, they will not know how to actually like figure out how to actually, you know, go through the, 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 the challenges. So I, I guess in the end, maybe it was lucky that, uh, so I didn't wear maybe the right things or I didn't do the right scene or I wasn't, um, it wasn't a good day, um, the day that we sh showed our self. But, but for many years later, I would be, um, it was generous. I was asked to test for TV shows and such. And honest to God, the thing that would come most often to me was, uh, can somebody go take her clothes shopping? Um, because, because what I was wearing was not exposing my body or something in the way that like these network executives needed to see. Um, so when Jody was asked earlier about changes by that lovely uh, uh, student, by that student, I, I was thinking about like, actually, I think there have been some positive changes. Now I'm also in my fifties now, nobody's really caring about whether or not I'm wearing clothes that fit, I think. But, but what I was gonna say is I don't think you're allowed to do that, I'm hoping, as, anymore. I'm kind of praying about that one. And um, so anyway, I, that's, I would say that some of my earliest challenges were how do you take like your, your intellectual brain that knows how wrong some things are, but that also really wants to get cast. And so you kind of sometimes say yes to what you think that they want you to be. And then I guess you hope that later you're gonna be able to be more you know, yourself. And, and, but sometimes that didn't work out. And there were some places that I worked and I'm about to finish with this. There's some places I work year after year after year. And I, I, I swear there were never any female directors on those like five years later, 10 years later, no women directing. And, and some of the people that were doing the script supervising that were begging and begging to, to be given the opportunities to direct it was instead like a young boy straight out of a fancy school that was given that opportunity. So uh, anyway, that's one of, I guess you could say those are some of the challenges that I, that I faced. Yeah, thank you so much. And I, you know, I think and hope that you're right that this is changing a bit. And I think it's partially, you know, we're, we're having the conversations about it. And I, so thank you so much for, for sharing. And Namina, um, I, I'd be curious too, in the publishing realm, if there are, are challenges that you've faced in relation to this. Um, it's funny, I think Marin, you and I have some overlap. Um, and actually I went to film school. I went to, uh, I went to USC. <laughs> film uh, and I did my N MFA there, but, and, but the reason why I did my MFA um, was because I decided to become an author at 19. So I immediately wrote um, during college three books and sent them out and I got back crickets. Um, and this is, this is the other thing is like, um, I'm a woman and I'm a black woman. So there's, there's another added layer of difficulty there in the United States. Uh, so when I said, and I could not figure out why um, my books weren't getting anything back because as an immigrant um, coming from Sierra Leone where everyone is black, like I understood intellectually American racism 
but I didn't understand it on a visceral level because that just was not, that was not my background. Like, you know, it wasn't something that like, was like my point of view. But back in those days, basically the idea was when I first, cause I first started um, trying to sell books around 2006, 2007, the idea was that um, black people do not sell books, um, especially not young adult. And they especially don't sell books with, uh, with uh, black people on the cover. I did not realize it then, but there was no avenue and no room in the industry for me. So I, after I got those rejections, I was like, okay, so maybe uh, writing is more of a pipe dream than I thought it was. Um, Cause I was just like, I'm great. Like, I know my writing is great. You know, like I, like, I was like, I don't know. I don't understand what's happening. I am a great writer. Why not? But I was like, you know what? Um, maybe I need some more patience with this. So let me go do something um, that I can maybe enjoy while uh, I wait out this writing thing. So uh, I applied to law school and got in because that was what my family wanted. And then I applied to USC and got in and I ran away to USC film school. Um, and while I was at USC, I wrote The Gilded Ones. Um, and uh, I was just like, oh, this is it. Like, you know, it's topical. I'm at the top of my writing game. Um, you know, hash like this was like, I wrote the Gilded Ones initially around 12, 2012. So it was like hashtag girl boss, girl power, all these things. I was like, oh, the time is right. I'm ready. Like I'm finally gonna get into the industry and I had other scripts. So uh, like Marin, um, after you graduate from, when you graduate with the, uh, with the writing track from USC, you have what's called first pitch where you go and you pitch to agents and managers um, and then hopefully you get an agent. And so here I am like in my little Africana vest because I always wear Africana and I sit down and I'm excited and I have all these projects to sell and I'm ready and I know I'm the best because I was the best. Like, like I'm not even going to joke. Like I was like, I was like, yes, this is the time. And I will never forget uh, this one agent from like, a, he was a new agent from a rather large agency. We have a great conversation. He's like, you know, I really, I really like your stuff, but, um, and, and like, this is all really cool, but nobody's going to buy it. No one wants to read stuff with black people. And that, <laughs> that this was, that was 2013. That was one of the worst years of my life because here was a gatekeeper telling me that because of who I was and because of what I wrote, I would never do this dream that I had wanted for so long. And, and this was just one in like a series. Cause like I was, I was used to getting rejections. Sorry. Um, I was used to getting rejections all the time. I was used to getting them pretty much um, constantly. And, but like, this was the one rejection where finally they said it out loud. Um, and I was like, okay back to the drawing board. Like I, at that point it was like, okay, maybe you need to quit writing. But I was like, I, I'm not gonna quit because like when I was growing up in Sierra Leone, the only time I felt safe was when I was reading. Um, it was when I was reading fantasy, like I could disappear into those worlds and everything would be okay and it didn't matter what was happening. And so I was like, that's what I want to do for other people. Like, that's why when I saw the whole writing thing, it clicked, it was like, oh, this is it. This is my purpose. So I was like, okay, I am going to continue on. Um, and I did, uh, and I struggled uh, very, very much. I could never quite get a job. I could never quite figure out my life um, until finally uh, I got an agent in around 2016. Um, but what really changed was Black Panther. When, when I saw the promos for Black Panther, I was like, oh, I think the time is right. Because like what, was, what, what had changed was I saw the, the um, response that it was getting on social media. I feel like Get Out like primed it and then Black, Black Panther sort of like slammed open the doors. Because once I saw that, I was like, oh, the time is right. Uh, so I told my agent about the book. 
Um, and I did a page one rewrite in a month and a half. And the day that I sent it out was the day that it sold. But yes, I struggled quite a bit. Yeah, thank you. It's so tough because it's like, I, I love how you're talking about the, the time specificity of that too. And it's like, it doesn't say anything about the quality of your work, but the, and then there's suddenly this moment in which it's taken up and it's received and and it, and it happens. And so thank you for, for speaking to that. And, um, and Regina, I'll, I'll toss it over to you. Yes, um, so I think this is a good segue into this question. Um, because it's kind of, I, I want to tell you a little story that I just had with my film three students and my film three students happen to be all boys. So you start in film one, now you're in film three, no women. And we were talking about, okay, how can we change this? <laughs> we need, and, uh, I've been here, you know, this is my first year and this is one of my goals at Winward. So if anybody is out there, you know, eighth grader thinking about ninth grade, I want you, if you're a woman, to come into film production, but how can we make that change? And they were talking about it and they said, well, you know, if, if the men are the directors or the men are making the decisions, they are going to look for people that are like them and they are going to hire those people. And so we need to start to make the changes so that the people that are hiring are not all white men. So, <laughs> which it was a great conversation to have with 11th grade boys. And if you're out there, thank you very much. But the question is, so um, what advice would you give to young storytellers who want to create a more inclusive environment in the entertainment industry? Because I'm sure there are many out there that eventually want to get there and they've got to be thinking about that now, um, just like I'm thinking about that now. So what advice would you give them? Um, Jody? if you can start us off and then Namina and Marin. Uh, you know, it's interesting. It's a tough one um, because uh, I, I grew up in the industry when there were no women. So there was a lady who played my mom and then there was possibly a makeup artist or maybe a script supervisor, but that was about it. So I really was surrounded by brothers and fathers and they taught me everything. And um, uh, it, you know, I, I, always, I used to say Jonathan Demme to me was, you know, my favorite female director because he really understood a woman's point of view. He was a feminist. And, um, uh, and then, you know, you look at something like Catherine Bigelow's work, which really is about male camaraderie and about, um, uh, about what that means to be a man. And um, ideally, we would hope that in the future, possibly, that we can all inhabit each other's worlds and inhabit each other's lives. Um, I know that as a, as a woman director, um, I'm always putting myself in someone else's body and I'm looking around, you know, I put myself in this character's body and I, and I look around and I say, huh, how does this feel? And how does, how does she like this? Or how does he like that? Um, it's interesting that male directors or men, of, of, at least of my generation, weren't taught how to do that. You weren't taught how to get inside other people's bodies and look out uh, subjectively. Um, they were just continually trying to form the world to their image. Um, so that is what, it, what is exciting about having different voices out there, uh, different points of view, different perspectives. Um, you know, how, how do we encourage uh, diverse stories and, and you know, diverse participation in the film business? I don't know that it just takes women producers because, you know, the when I was 30, I think the, the top four uh, distribution companies were all headed by women. It didn't change anything. Um, it, there, was, there certainly was, and I would almost say there was less representation for women directors under those regimes than there, there certainly is now, but <clears throat> even that came after them. So I don't know that there is a formula for that. You know, we've, we all have sort of internalized idea of, of what's a risk, who's a risk, what does a risk look like? Um, you're right, Very usually people will say, oh, I want somebody who looks like me because that's gonna be less of a risk. Uh, but it is surprising how we internalize this idea of risk. Um, so so I, I don't know that there's a fast fast answer to that except to um, make, make, you know, become your characters and look out through their eyes and that will necessarily take you to a more diverse landscape. And Namina, any advice for the soon-to-be filmmakers out there and storytellers? 
Um, wow, I, <laughs> I think that's a huge question. Um, I think coming from novel land, one thing I will say is um, don't tell people stories that aren't your own. Like help other, like you can help other people tell their stories, but don't tell other people's stories. I'll give you an example. So there, um, I read this one story um, that, that is about um, a group of Native Americans um, who settle in, I believe it's Oklahoma after the Trail of Tears. Um, be, and uh, they settle on land that is oil rich. And because the land can only go um, according to family, um, they, they swiftly become very wealthy. Um, and the surrounding white community, um, because of this, starts marrying into this tribe and killing them off. This is a true story. Like, I think like um, one woman, she married this guy and I think like in less than a year, maybe 10 members of her family had mysteriously died. Um, and this was one of the reasons why the FBI was created was because all the entire town, um, like the cops and everybody were in on this. And to me, this is an amazing story. This is like, I'm like, whoa, I want like this story, I think is just, it's so timely, it's so present, it's also so horrific, but it's not my story to tell, you know? So like, I keep like saying the story and waiting and hoping that there is somebody of this tribe who is like telling this story. And I'm like, if I see you, like, I, like I'm like, however way I can help and support or whatever, I'm here, but it's not my story to tell. Um, another thing is like, I was watching, um, I was watching, what is it called? Sex in the City recently. And I looked at it and I love Sex in the City, but I noticed none of the direct, none of the writers were women. None of the directors were women. And I can't help but wonder what Sex in the City would have been like if it had actually been written and directed by women. So I know this is like a very simplistic sort of thing, but I think that if we are to make room for other people, we have to actually let them tell their stories from their own point of view, because there's an added layer um, of lived experience that we do not have. So there are so many stories that I could tell and that I would love to tell, but I know that I don't have that added layer of experience, just like you know, a person cannot, um, I think with any sort of verisimilitude, write my own story. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. And I think Drew and Colleen would agree with me when our students are working on their stories and their screenplays, we say, write what you know. What, what's your story? And they always start there, you always start there. And probably something good is in there. Um, Maren, any advice for, for the, the students here? These two exquisite women have so eloquently said what, you know, I was taking notes of what I thought, and then each one, I'm like, wait a minute, Jody said it, and I'm gonna just said it. You know, I, um, I well, you know, um, I think there's something incredible right now about uh, how much content is out here and how easily um, accessible it is at not a lot of uh, not a lot of cost. Like um, uh, uh, Jody has a masterclass series that anyone that wants to be a filmmaker has got to watch. It's extraordinary. But then if you want to learn to be a chef, go, you know, watch the masterclass to be a chef, right? Or what have you, or to become a writer. I, it's just exquisite that you can, that's it, not that much money. And then um, there, there, there are shows out here right now. Um, Issa Rae's show, Insecure, um, Michaela Cole's show, uh, what was it? I May Destroy You, right? I mean, these are unbelievable tales that when I was growing up uh, as, as a young woman, I didn't, there was nothing like the, this kind of freedom of expression that, that women like that were, were displaying. And um, it's, thr it's really thrilling, isn't it? And so um, I guess I would just encourage everybody that uh, is out there and, and it, it is to find, it's exactly what these two women just said, is to find um, the voice that is inside you that makes you feel unique 
and uh, to trust it. Because I know one thing about myself is that I w was, still am, deeply insecure. And I did a lot of my early artistic life thinking, oh, how do I become a different person than what I, um, than what I am? You know, this insecurity has got to go. Um, but, but the truth is like embracing my insecurity is maybe part of the reason I get some of the roles I get and, and just sort of letting myself get more, uh, accepting of, of what my spirit is. And then also back to that original thing I was telling you is about looks like this is, this is the, this is it. You know what I mean? It got my funny hands or my weird nose or my odd hunch, whatever I have. And this is what I'm going to offer to the roles. So, um, I guess, the, the embrace, embracing of oneself is what I, I'm, I, I would offer as advice to, to young people starting out. You guys awesome. are all, all those students you have, they're, in, they're incredible. I've been lucky enough. That's the one thing is the, the greatest thing I've done in my life is become a, a parent. My son is the best thing I've ever been able to be lucky enough to, to do. And then on top of that, it, the next greatest thing has been to be in programs like this one, where I talk to people who are starting out their lives. Before this all started tonight, I was talking about a young boy on this TV show that just is walking out of school and his first job, guys, is tomorrow. And he's got the most incredible role. And I can feel light coming out of him. And it's it's like, we all wanna celebrate with him. And that that is, you know, anyway, I, I, why did I say all that? But I'm really thrilled about this program at offering, you know, what, what these young people are gonna do. And we're gonna sit there and just, you know, they're going to take this in, into new, new, new levels and realms. Thank you so much. They will be so happy that if they're just themselves, they'll be okay. <laughs> All right, Colleen, I think you have some questions from some students. Yeah. Um, speaking of our great students. Okay. I've actually got another one from Elle um, for Namina. Um, and so she's wondering, um, what do you think is most important to keep in mind while creating a fantastical version of a topical real world issue like sexism or racism. So in this kind of weaving of fantasy space and then these things that are very real and palpable, what do you think or what has been useful to you in navigating that space or what do you think is most important um, when, when putting those two things together? That is an amazing question and a difficult one. Again, like y'all are coming with these questions. Okay, so um, I will just say the things that I find useful. For me, um, all fantasy, um, especially, um, especially the type of fantasy that I write rests in the real. Um, and especially if you are using, because fantasy to me is the most, if, one of the most effective vehicles for sort of um, examining our society because it's also the most painless vehicle. Like I was drawn to fantasy because I am someone who uh, suffers from PTSD because of my past, like fantasy offers that remove, right? There's a glass between you and like um, everything else. So it's not really real, but it has to rest on a foundation of the real. So what I would say is number one, make sure you do your research, right? Um, because I think like one of the easiest ways, especially if you're writing fantasy that is wanting to delve into um, sort of uh, sort of topical issues and that sort of thing, you really need to understand that. Like before I wrote The Gilded Ones, um, I went to Spelman College, um, and uh, which is all black and all female. And they had an amazing women's studies program, which meant that I spent a lot of time reading feminist literature. And that is sort of the backbone of the book. So I did like, before I could even touch the book, I'd done years of research to be able to sort of like, cause you have to like sort of do research to a level where you internalize it and then you forget like the actual stuff. You just have it sort of inside of you. So I would say um, do, do research, make sure that you come from that foundation of what is real and then you can talk about stuff. So like research enough that you internalize it enough to forget it. like. Because right now, if you ask me the books that I read, I can't even tell you, but I can sort of break down the principles for you because it's, it's in the back of my mind. So yeah. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, that's an awesome answer, right? Because even in the fantasy space, there's got to be all these layers that make that fantasy space feel real. And so all those all those levels of research become really important. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Regina, I think you got a student question. Yes, of course, Jody. somebody has to ask you something about Taxi Driver. <laughs> so this is uh, Jackson Feldman. He's in my film two class. Working on Taxi Driver at the age of 12, how do you think those young experiences shaped your creative outlook going forward? Was it helpful or detrimental? Well, actually making Taxi Driver was probably the biggest shift uh, if, as an actor that I've ever experienced. Um, so I was a child actor and mostly I was asked to learn my lines and act natural. That's pretty much what they always asked me. You know, they just say, be natural, ask, you know, act natural. Um, and I thought, wow, that's a really dumb job. And I definitely don't want to do that when I grow up. That just sounds really not stimulating enough. Um, I went to do Taxi Driver. I had already done um, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore with Scorsese. I had seen all of his movies. I went to do Taxi Driver and Robert De Niro decided that he wanted to meet with me. So he kept picking me up from my hotel in New York and he would take me to a deli and we would run the lines and then he would just be quiet and not say anything and be super awkward. And then we'd run the lines again, it'd be super awkward. This would go on many, many times. And then finally on the last time that he picked me up, at this point I was so, I was kind of bored with him and annoyed with him and talking to other people and, on the last time, we all knew the lines incredibly well, and he um, just started talking and throwing in improvisations. And I mean, it's probably terribly obvious, but at 12 years old, I guess I just never realized, I, I didn't realize that I hadn't been giving the job the depth that it deserved. And it really was my fault that, um, you know, you, you, you bring to the party uh, the depth that you're looking for. So. Um, that was a huge shift for me. And I realized that possibly, possibly, not sure, but possibly this acting thing was something that I might want to do when I grew up. Um, you know, working with a master character, you know, a character builder like uh, Robert De Niro and a master filmmaker like Scorsese was, you know, it was, um, it was a film school. That was my film school. And um, I just feel very lucky that, you know, I had that experience. I mean, that being said, you, you come up with, uh, through experience, you come up with your own ways of doing things that are different than the actors or directors that you work with. Um, you come up with your own primer, really, you know, your set of ideas about how things work. And one of the ones that I like to tell people, young, young filmmakers, is to ask yourself, is it real or is it fake? And it, that really is the only question that I ask myself all day as a director. Every single time that somebody asks me a question is looking for an answer, I, I say to myself, is it real? Is that real? Would that be real? Is that true? It doesn't mean that you're not working on a fantasy film or a CG movie or that you're not talking about Martians, but um, you're, you're always looking for the honesty in something. And um, that is, that's the, those are the only questions that are, are going to give you answers like, you know, what is he wearing? What is the character wearing? Well, he's wearing something, you know, tight fitting and um, uh, incredibly formal because he wants to present in a certain way. You know, every answer has a, a history of a knowledge of the character behind it. And those are the questions that you have to ask yourself. And once you do that, really, there, there really isn't anything else to do to learn. Awesome. Okay, Colleen, your turn. All right, I've got one from Marin. Um, this is a fun one. Okay, so um, how did you make the decision to switch to acting after your injury in ballet? Great question. Um, see, I, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier that it, I was, um, I had the most incredible group of friends. I actually have always had the incredible group of friend, friends, I really have. And so when I got to college, I just kept, um, it wasn't similar to what happened after grad school. It took me a long time. I've always been like a, a, a tortoise and not a hare for the cliche. And so it took me a long time at Brown before I actually was even cast, lots of auditions. In some ways it was like harder to get cast at Brown than it even became later on in my life because there were so many talented people there when I, when I was there. Um, 
but um we actually, I just forgot the question. Could you go back for a sec and remind me? It's about the move to acting after dance. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. So I think that when I was going to, I wasn't cast, but um, I felt that the, the best way for me to continue to be connected to theater was to see it. And that's something that I, I think I would remind everybody is that you know much of being an artist, a storyteller is actually sadly, I think often not being employed, particularly as an actor. I think it's a little different as a writer or maybe even as a director sometimes because you can be more in charge of your work. As an actor often you were like waiting, sadly, which is why I think it's really important if you're an actor, I'm gonna give you all a piece of advice if you wanna be actors, have something else you love doing. Have something else because you're gonna have so much time and you're not acting please find something else. So anyway, I was finding myself seeing as much theater as I could on campus at Brown and all of those people that were on those stages, I would see them on campus and I was like trying to, like I was a magnet, just drawn to how expressive they were in their own everyday experience of life. And I, I just found myself drawn to them and wanting to be, even if, even if by the way, I wasn't gonna be on a stage with them, I was gonna like, be there, I was gonna make their costumes or I was gonna like, even like, honestly, I was gonna uh, comb their hair backstage. I just wanted to be around it. And then after hanging around it long enough, suddenly the door started opening a little bit more. And by the way, that is advice I would give to a lot of actors out there, wannna-be actors. Because I didn't get my agent early on, I said to the people that I met, I wanna be a reader for you. You're not gonna have to pay me. I mean, I got my money like, you know, being a waitress or something. That's how I was doing. But I was like, I just wanna be around this creative life. And then I found myself, you know, being an usher so I could see as many plays as possible. So back to that original question is, I think that I just felt myself drawn to the theater life and the other parts of my education weren't as uh, percolated and thrilling. I wanted to be around that kind of thrill and the community of people. And I still feel that way. Like I actually feel like the, the most exciting places I go are uh, amongst, amongst you know, an artistic group of people. That's great. Yeah, it's like, it's like, a, it's a magnet, <laughs> you know, and it pulls you in. Um, Regina, I'll, I'll toss it back to you. Okay, I feel like we had some cool podcasts going on now, <laughs> like tossing it back and forth. Okay, so this is coming from someone who is here with us tonight, Amy, and she put this in the chat. And this is for everyone. So Namina, I'm going to ask you to answer first, um, then we'll go to Marin and Jody. So uh, what is giving you hope about the future of the arts and as an artist right now? In a year which put a lot of the work on pause and shined a very bright light on a lot of injustice within the industry for women, for people of color, et cetera, what do you hope for on the other side of this thing? And what changes do you see being made within the industry? So I know that's a lot, but if you could take a piece of that nomina and let us know what you see as the future. All right. So actually today I just came from another panel uh, for um, that was the debut for Ace of State spades, which is this book right here. Um, and it was written by a 22 year old um, who got a seven figure deal for this book. Um, and so it's a huge book and she's black. When I was writing at 22, this, this, this wasn't even a thought, you know, like it wasn't even, like it wasn't even something that I could hope at. It wasn't even a whiff of something that I could even like sniff in the distance. But here we are um, and I'm sitting down and like there's a row of books behind me that all have black faces on them. Um, this was not something that I had growing up. More importantly, what I see whenever I go online is um, just sort of the reception that um, artists of color um, queer artists, um, gender diverse artists, like all sorts of different artists are finally getting a chance to be in the spotlight. But even more importantly, um, I'm seeing that people are fighting for what um, needs to happen more. Like, for instance, like I was reading an article today um, where this one um, young man was sort of talking about like creators on TikTok um, and how black creators like are sort of being like shafted. But like, it was interesting for me to see that he was getting like, he was getting such um, 
what is the word engagement from that where people were actually engaging with that like literally 10 years ago these were not conversations we were having like if you had like 10 years ago when um when i wrote well almost 10 years ago when i first wrote the gilded ones um i made my main character mixed because there was no way that somebody would sell buy something that had that was like completely black now here's these and that to me like just is amazing and the fact that um the next generation is going to bat for these different artists and saying no this is not okay these things are really messed up and these things are really problematic is amazing so like i'm just gonna say i have all the hope like and i am just so excited because like even during the pandemic like um there were all the protests and like i honestly i am not the type of person who protests mainly because first of all like my work is a protest that's like my form of it but also like i can't do crowds like that but like i stepped outside to just be a part of it and to see and to my shock, I saw that like the people who are like marching for like Black, Black Lives Matter and all these things, like half of them weren't even Black. And that just told me that finally it seems like the gears are shifting and that things are changing. And I am honestly like, I'm so happy for it. I'm so excited. I, I am optimistic. I am just... I am honestly just so thrilled to see where we go from here because like the kind of conversations that we're having today, the kind of things that are happening today are things that I frankly could not have even dreamed. So I'm just very grateful. Very hopeful it sounds as well, that's wonderful. Um, Marin, how about you in terms of this pause that we've had, um, hopefully some changes in the industry, have you seen anything or are hopeful? For anything i am very, i i i don't think i can even speak more eloquently than what i've just heard i i agree i feel like god this past year was you know devastating for so many reasons and um you know i i watched my son's friends um you know talk about uh things that when i was growing up like mental health i I was not comfortable speaking about. Um, it was. It would be way too frightening for me to have told my parents. I'm. I'm really depressed. You know. I didn't know how to do that. I, and I remember, as I told this group earlier, when I injured myself. I. Uh, you know. I'd spent like I was kind of an athlete in a way because I'd spent four or five hours every day dancing, and then all of a sudden with the injury, it was not none of that. So I came home from school, sat there for hour after hour, and didn't know how to actually you know, continue, really, I didn't understand. But I find it incredible that kids these days are able to be eloquent and say, I need some help. I need to, to talk about this stuff. And, and then to access on, you know, using, you know, this is this thing is, is, is got a lot of problems, but it also can offer, you know, more connection, right? There are there is that. Um, so I would just speak to, it's hard to speak more to what you have just beautifully said, but I would say that just the, I'm very, I'm very hopeful that young people have a way of communicating with each other and an openness in doing so that when I grew up, that was, that was judged. Thank you so much. And Jody, for you, just um, having this pause that we've had, what kind of changes are you hoping for or maybe you've seen? Yeah, I'm definitely going to repeat my repeat everybody else's uh, statements. You know, this uh, it's a transitional moment that we're in right now. You know, this awareness and consciousness, um, this you know, finally uh, a grasp of the social justice that's necessary in our country and and in the world um, that's dividing us and bringing us together at the same time. You know, it's uncomfortable, um, and that has such promise. And such promise to look on the other side of that, and even though it is a painful transition. Um, so yeah, that openness really speaks to great things happening uh, for the creative world, for the creative life, but just specifically to the pandemic time, you know, that weird thing of being stuck in your homes or not being able to touch people or being afraid that 
um, of sickness or you know being resistant to the idea that it exists all of this these the the us grappling with fear and um, deep things and not having all the answers um, I, th I feel like all of us that are now freed to go back to the world want to change that world that we're going back to um, because we realized how insufficient it was um, and, and I, th I think that's really encouraging. I feel like the work that's going to come out of this is going to have a depth um, that really wasn't available to us before. Although I have a feeling people are really going to want some comedy soon. I don't know about you, but that's just my my thought. Yes, and they can get that from Marin with uh, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I hope. <laughs> I hope they'll be watching. Um, okay, thank you, uh, Colleen. Go ahead. Okay, um, so I, I've i got um, a question here, kind of pie in the sky question. Um, so is there a dream project that you would want to work on or create? So if you could just like pull, pull out of the sky, the thing that you'd want to work on, um, kind of dream project, um, what would that be? And maybe we'll start um, with Namina, then Marin and Jody. Um, honestly, I am already working on my dream project. Um, I am the type of creator, I like creating my own things. Um, so um, I have a new idea. I'm so very excited about it. Um, I'm all jiggly with excitement. Um, but just in general, like I am very happy <laughs> with the projects that I'm doing. Um, just the fact that I get to be a writer is a dream. The fact that I get to see, sit here and talk to you and I'm on a panel with like two people that I am just like massive fans of. I didn't say this before because you know, I was trying to be cool, I'm cool. But like, and but just, I, I'm just gonna tell y'all, I'm gonna brag about this later. Um, but like, I, this is all a dream. Um, <laughs> so I have, I'm already working on those projects. I don't know what else to say except this. This is all amazing to me. No, that's a that's an awesome answer. That makes me really happy. Um, all right, Maren, how about you? Well, I'll take that and run with it. My new dream project is working with you all here. How about these two women that are on this panel? That seems like a dream. Um, and then I'll throw it out that I have so much that I learned from motherhood that I would love to to. Uh, to better understand it, this subject. And my kid is, my glorious child is heading off to college. So I'd like to work with young people. I'd like to, um, the TV show I work with right now has a, a woman that plays my daughter in it. Every day I learn from her. She is not just acting, she's become a producer. She's taking uh, uh, fantasy um, young adult um, novels and bringing them to life as a producer and I go I do not understand how you're memorizing your 40 pages and producing and doing everything you're doing she's very much like Jody actually that way and um I want to I want to work with get that spirit and, and and take it and like support it that's what I'd like to do and I would like to learn I think I want to assist um directors and and writers I, I I have there's a lot of as I said earlier a lot of doors that close um as we, well, maybe I didn't say this, but getting older as a woman, as an actress, harder. We, I think we all know that it's true. So I need to open up and expand to other artistic places. Yeah, thanks so much. And to, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, that's like my favorite thing, right? Like we get me and Regina and Drew, we get to work with all these young people and they like think that we're teaching them. And I'm like, no, you're <laughs> teaching me. <laughs> I do this because you're teaching me. Um, Jody, how about you? Dream, uh, dream projects. Yeah, I mean, I'm I, the one thing that I'm working on that I'm super excited about. And the hard the hard thing about the movie business is you just never know whether it's actually going to happen. So you can work on something for 10, 15 years and you don't actually know that it's actually going to happen. So I, I I always I try not to tell anyone what it is so that I just don't get eternally disappointed. But um I I agree that, and maybe this is a function of age, that um I used to believe when I was young that movies were everything. And I didn't really think that there was anything else in life. And I thought that was the only thing that pursuit that was important. It was more important than being a soldier, than being a patriot, than being, you know, any number of things, making movies. 
Um, and as you know, recently, really just recently, I have actually come to realize that there are more important things in life. And um, it's very freeing uh, because it means that the, it means A, that I get to pursue other things that feel meaningful to me in different ways. I get to be challenged by new things, um, but also it re-injects a kind of vitality into the work that I've done on film because I'm so interested in serving other people whose time it is. Um, it was a hard revelation. There was a moment maybe, you don't know, maybe five, six years ago where I said, oh, wow, I think that it's not really necessarily my time. I had my time and it's now someone else's time and I'm here to serve them. And there's something really freeing about that and wonderful. I just did a film or a, a while ago called The Mauritanian. And I think the best part of making the movie was really sitting in that room with Tahar Rahim, the actor in the film, and watching him deliver a performance and transform into a character. Um, it was so great to be the, on the other side of that, helping him, driving him, um, conversing with him to allow him to, you know, to find that space holding the space for him. Great, thank you so much. And I think now we'll turn to some more student and community questions. So Regina, do you have one oh, lined right. up for us? I do, and I just wanna shout out Mauritanian, a uh, wonderful film and uh, Golden Globe, Jody. So congratulations, congratulations. I'm sure you were teaching him, but man, it, it was great. It was great to, to watch you in that. Um, okay, this is actually for Jody. This comes from Dylan. He said in Contact, in the film Contact, there are a lot of CGI effects. So how did you immerse yourself in the plot and how did you act, even if it's hard to see the world you're acting in, which I think is obviously very prevalent for, for actors today with the films that are coming out. So how are you able as an actor to get into that role and to act with things that may not be there? Uh, yeah, obstacles. Um, that was 20 years ago. So, you know, the kind of CG stuff that we did that took us forever, like I was talking about stuff, you know, we had massive, huge cameras in order to accomplish things that I can do today on my phone. Um, the, but, but doing a CG movie where, you know, you're working with a lot of green screen, uh, you're having to uh, remember where you were. I even did some things in that movie where I had to do an entire piece of dialogue backwards. I had to learn it backwards. Um, for some reason, I don't really understand. I'm sure today we could do it very easily, but at the time it's very complicated. Um, you're always running into obstacles because your job is to make something real that um, where there's a forced element to it, you know, um, to create an internal reality, to create an internal honesty, even though you're surrounded by 175 people, um, to, you know, be able to not be distracted by, by, that, by that fourth wall. Um, uh, you know, I, th I think that you just find the truth in things and um, it's a meditation. I didn't really realize that until I got older that um, when somebody said, uh, when I first started meditation and I realized how easy it was and I was like, wow, I thought it was gonna be this tough thing. How is it possible that I can meditate within seconds? And then somehow this is very easy for me. And I realized that um, it was a tool that I had already come up with in order to figure out how to do what I did as a young person. Um, so our creative lives are, uh, we, we find out tools, survival tools in order to figure out how to, to, to survive intact and to be as real a person and as honest a person as possible. Okay, awesome. And I love my film students and the films that they have to create because they don't have those worlds, right? They have to just do it old school and they learn so much. Okay, Colleen, go ahead. All right, this is a, another one that's about kind of immersing yourself. Um, so for Marin, this is from Kyler. Um, when acting in um, a production like Marvelous Mrs. Maisel that's set in the past um, or just in general, um, is it harder to act um, in a role that takes place in a different time period compared to something that's um, more contemporary or modern day? Um, you know, I hadn't done, I actually hadn't done it in television and film. I had done it a lot in theater and loved it, loved every second of it. And so I was actually um, 
nervous about it. And I had to do what we were all talking about earlier. I had to just do a different level of research. I kind of inundated myself in all documentaries of the time period. I read about it. I looked at uh, magazines about what the women looked like. I just you know, embraced and embraced it. It's, it's a little strange sometimes to be an actor because you do all that work and then you show up on set and you do have your costume designer and your, you know, um, you know, hair and makeup people and they kind of have their own ideas. And so you don't, you sort of have to keep open to, to that, that, that kind of stuff. But then you hope that it's, it becomes collaborative. So in my particular show I'm working on, which is, was started in 1957, um, I, I was so thrilled Two, here's two things. I was so thrilled to get away from some of the stuff that was happening in our country. Let's just leave it at that and not get too political. But I was like excited to go to another time. But then I was kind of amazed by the way that there were so many things going on in the 50s that seemed to still be going on. And I was kind of shocked by that. But then the other thing I'd say is we shoot in New York and an exquisite thing about being um, a, a performer that can work in um in an environment in a city like I, I love New York is that they brought New York back into the 50s. And that is a dream. It's like taking me right back to the fantasy life that we were both, all of us were talking about, but that I actually disappear into history. And now when I walk around the city of New York, I see parts of it in like stores, restaurants, streets that I, I worked in that were pulled back in time. And it's, it's, it feels like I'm entering like the age of innocence. You know, it's just amazing. I'm time traveling, which is part of why I think I love being an actor. So yes, it's exciting and thrilling. I, I, I love, you know, acting in a different time. That is so cool. I love that. I, yeah, you get to time travel. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, you know, when you're little and you, and you play, it, it was an amazing thing when I went to grad school and we were like, oh, play, this is what we're doing, plays. You're just kind of playing. And I thought, you know, it's my sort of, in, in you know, my infantilized part of me that wants to stay a child forever and just keep playing, so. <laughs> All right, Regina. Yes, uh, Drew is telling me our time, I can't believe is almost up. So Namina, I have a question uh, for you. This is coming from Bobby. He said, do you think you are going to make a sequel to The Gilded Ones? And maybe you could tell us a little bit more because I know you're writing the screenplay and this is going to be a film, right? Eventually, uh, if you can give us any background of what's happening. Um, so The Gilded Ones is actually a trilogy. Um, I uh, turned in the screenplay. Um, so I'm very excited about that. And I am currently working on the rewrite of book two. So, and hopefully that will be done in a couple of weeks. So yeah, um, it, it's almost, book two is almost here and hopefully the, hopefully we will get a movie, we'll see. Well, we've got a, a major director here, so maybe she can think about it. <laughs> All right, um, so I'm gonna hand things over to Drew. Thank you, ladies, it was wonderful. Students. Storytellers, when we're community. Wow, what a wonderful gift we've all shared here together with these inspiring women of storytelling and innovation. As we can see from our luminary panelists, our individual voices and stories matter. It is important now more than ever that we recognize that the business of storytelling demands equity and representation for all. As we've learned here tonight, our panelists have all navigated a difficult, business and have each created ways to express who they are, their arts and their dreams, but not without adversity and not without unfairness or prejudice. But if we can continue to learn and discuss our industry's challenges with inequalities and representation, we can all be a part of making our craft and our business more beautiful, more truthful and more honorably equal for all of us especially for those stories and storytellers that have not yet been heard. A final round of applause for our panelists and our moderators. Special thanks to our visual and media arts department, to Jeff Gilder, our director of alumni development and engagement for helping us produce this, to Lindsay, our director of development and special events, and to you, our community, for being here and for being a part of this work. Last round of applause, thank you all. And good night.